Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Word of Life midweek message. Are you ready to be encouraged to experience growth in your walk with Christ and to pursue all that God has for you? Then grab a pen, open your heart, and get ready to hear this week's message. You can find us online, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and remember to log in each week for a new eChurch message. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to Word of Life's midweek service. My name is Pastor Donnie Haynes, and I'm going to be bringing you the Word of the Lord tonight. If you open your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. Praise God. And I'd like for you to turn to verse 1. And we'll begin to read there together. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Actually, Exodus 17. Exodus 17. Thank you, Lord, looking right at 18. When it was Exodus 17. Exodus 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why do you chide with me or become angry with me? And wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Being angry at the leader, he said, because God wasn't doing certain things, they took it out on the leader. And Moses said unto them, Why do you get angry with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses. And said, Wherefore is this that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. <laughs> Praise God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. Watch this carefully. Go on before the people in front of them. And take with you the elders of Israel and your rod, wherefore, wherewith you smote the river. Take in your hand. Take it in your hand and go. All right. Behold, I stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb. And you shall smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. <clears throat> and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding or the anger of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose, you, choose us out, men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Did you see that? Verse 9 again. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go fight. Go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So we're not just fighting natural battles. We're fighting them with the presence of God, the power of God, and the authority of God. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now remember, in his hand is the rod of God. All right? That's the, the signal, the sign of authority. So he's lifting up this rod in his hand. And when he let it, when, he, when his hand let down, Amalek prevailed. Do you see that when his hand was in the air, he prevailed? When his hand went down to the ground, Amalek prevailed. Now God told them to go out and fight. He led them and directed them to fight against Amalek. And yet, though God gave them, wisdom, gave them direction, direction is to go out and fight with Amalek, but God's wisdom to, to Moses was, as long as your hand is in the air, the rod of God is in your hand and that hand is lifted in the air, you will prevail. 
But when you don't, he goes, when your hand gets tired and it gets to set down, Amalek will prevail. All right? Let me read verse 11 to you again. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Isn't it interesting? Actually, God never told him, as long as your hand's in the air, you'll prevail. It was an experience that he had that he just began to understand, began to realize that when his hand was up, with the word of God, the authority of God in his hand, when his hand was up, when it when had the upper hand, then the, Israel, the Israelites began to prevail against the enemy. But when that hand got tired, and that hand began to drop, and that authority began to drop, then the enemy began to prevail. It's a whole lot like we read in Ephesians chapter 6 about taking the whole armor of God. You see, if just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that you're going to prevail, no, the, no, even though God's bo you're born again and born of the Spirit of God, it's not a guarantee that you're going to prevail. No, it is a guarantee that your name is written in the book of life, and it's a guarantee that you're going to go to heaven when you pass or when the rapture comes. I, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. But I'll tell you this, but we're not going to overcome the devil by just walking out in the flesh and, and, and overcome in life with just walking out and living a life in the flesh. What does that mean to live a life in the flesh? Just letting your, letting your mind and your natural mind and your mouth just say whatever it wants to say and your body to do whatever it wants to do and to think you're going to have victory. Now, you'll be born again. You'll be saved by the blood of the Lamb. And we've got churches and preachers trying to preach into hell. If you start doing bad things, you're going to go to hell. And it's like, so there's salvations from week to week and from altar call to altar call. But either you're saved or you're not saved. Either you're born again or you're not born again. Amen? The, by the way, being born again is the gift of God. It, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God doesn't take it away. But if you start, if you start dr dropping your hands... In the midst of the battle, which many Christians, if not most Christians, we all, I don't, I've never met a Christian that hasn't done it. But if you do it for a continual period of time, you're going to find yourself living a defeated life. Even though you're born again and the, the, the victor lives on the inside of you, you're going to find yourself not living a very victorious life. Amen? Let's continue to read. I feel the anointing begin to rise up within me. We haven't even prayed yet, but just want to read these scriptures to you and set the tone for us. But Moses' hands were heavy. Moses' hands were heavy. Why? The battle went on longer than he anticipated. We never know how long the battle's going to be. We just think it could be a, a quick skirmish, but sometimes it's longer than we, than we desire. Most of the time it's longer than we desire or that we anticipate. And they took a stone, whose they, remember Aaron and Hur were with him, and put it under him, and he sat thereupon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. Now, God says, as long as your hand's in the air, you'll prevail. But, but Aaron and her grabbed both of his hands. They stayed up his hands, both of them. God said, as long as your hand's in the air, amen. As long as your hand, when his hand was in the air, he prevailed. Look at this, verse 11. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, hand, singular, he prevailed. Glory to God, hallelujah. But notice what happened when his hand began to get heavy. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone. He probably switched that rod from hand to hand, and all of a sudden, both hands were heavy. He probably switched that back and forth, and, and I mean, through the, as the day wore on, and you'll see the day did wear on. It wasn't, he, they, he, in, the, in the beginning of the morning when the sun rose up is when, maybe he says, I'll go to the top of the hill when the sun comes up. Well, why don't you to see this? <laughs> Praise God. I don't know why I always see these things. The Lord shows me these things, and I, I think they, they probably scare the body of Christ. I hope they encourage you. But these are things we read, but for some reason we read right over them and hoping, acting like we didn't see them and hoping that they weren't true for us. But let's look at verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now, I don't know what month this was. But let's just stop and imagine this was happened in, um, let's say, this happened in, the, the, in June, all right? So here in June, June 21st is the longest day, I believe, is it June 21st or 22nd? I think it's 21st, 22nd. It's summer solstice, and you have winter solstice in December 21st. I, I keep getting mixed up, 21st, 22nd, but it's one of those two days. And you have this summer solstice and winter solstice, which in December... It's the shortest day of the year, the shortest amount of daylight. 
and in the, and, and the June is summer solstice, and that's when the longest day. So we, and so we don't understand, we don't know what day this was. So let's take it somewhere in the middle between winter solstice and summer solstice. And let's say that in winter solstice, you realize the sun goes down and it's dark. Really, it's dark about 5 o'clock. All right? In the summer, it's about 9 o'clock. So let's just act like it's 7 o'clock. All right? So we'll take the mean, the mean of those two seasons, of the shortest and the longest season. Let's find the mean, and it'll be in between 5 and 9 will be 7. So we'll say at 7 o'clock at night, the sun sets, all right? And that's basically what you're going to see here in Texas in March. The sun will be set about 7 o'clock. And it comes up at about 7 o'clock in the morning. So you have a 12-hour day. Moses basically, give or take an hour or so, was on top of the mountain at 7 o'clock in the morning. And he was on top of that mountain to the victory is one at seven o'clock at night. Now, I've done this in my church and, and I've preached this in my church before, but you hold up your hand and you see how long you can do that. Now, I've held my hand up for about 10 seconds, going about 10, 15 seconds, okay? And I feel, you know, I'm not feeble, so I can do this for a while. But all, all of a sudden now on the, my shoulder and the back of my arm, I'm starting to feel a little bit of a pull. My hand's been in the air for about 15 seconds. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise God. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Spirit of God. The Spirit of love. The Spirit of power. And the Spirit of a sound mind. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach this gospel to, the, to you, the poor in spirit. To preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. Hallelujah. To bring a healing and a coming together of the wounds that have been in your heart. Through lies of the enemy, through deceptions of darkness. Glory to God. Here comes the anointing. Praise God. Flow, Holy Spirit, into your people. By the power of God that's flowing to me and flowing through me right now in the name of Jesus. Strengthen every heart. And held, hold up every arm in the name of Jesus. As Aaron and her came to help Moses and set him under a rock. And set, him, set a rock underneath him. So in the name of Jesus, you that are weary with doing what is right and well. I come in the name of Jesus with the presence of the Holy Spirit. With the water of God. And as an elder of God, I take the, the rod of the Lord, which is the authority of the name of Jesus. And I smite this rock in the name of Jesus. And the waters of the living God begin to flow out to you today. To give you thirst. To, give, to quench your thirst. And to fill you right before the battle. For the battle comes the next day. And when you begin to get weary, you begin to find yourself talking evil about the Lord and talking evil about His anointed. This is when you begin to think about quitting church and changing churches. Generally, we quit, we change before we quit. But we start changing, then we start finding ourselves saying, oh, nobody can feed me. And you start blaming every minister and you start blaming every preacher and you find some reason to quit. and You find some reason to give up and to give in. But I'm here to tell you today that God has ordained a rock for you and God is standing on that rock. And God's presence, hallelujah, will come to you where water will come out of that rock and will fill you, praise God, to overflowing. And then the next day you'll find yourself in a battle. Glory to God. That we need to be, when you're worn out and you're exhausted, you have to have some water. But notice that there's no rain. It's not a season. It's not a place where water can be gathered, where a reservoir can collect it, where you can have an abundance of it. No, this is where water comes out of that rock. It comes gushing out of that rock, but it comes for that day. We also read about give us this day our daily bread, that there's a touch of God. There's a, there's a, there's an, a, a certain segment of, a, a, a portion, if you will, of God that is given to us. Praise God. And it's not so much an abundance, but it seems like you give us this day our daily bread, that it's enough faith to get us through the day. It's enough wisdom to get us through the battle. It's enough water to, to fill us that we can stand up and fight another day. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In our walk in this life, there is, we, we, we feel like we can be in a wilderness. We've, time you deal with traffic and raising children and, and fighting the system and trying to overcome it and try to pay your bills. It's difficult. At best, it's difficult. It's not easy. It's a, it's a tiresome and a wearisome world. Jesus said, in this world, you will have persecution. 
But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Jesus said in this life, this is many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. The word of God says through Isaiah, God says through, to, through the prophet Isaiah, that even the youngest and strongest of lions will utterly run out of strength. But they that wait upon the Lord, praise God, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run, praise God, and not be weary. They shall r- walk and not faint. In other words, there's a supply of the Spirit. There's an anointing of God that comes to us day by day. And gets us through the season of darkness. And gets us through the season of dryness. And you have to call upon the name of the Lord. Now instead of, instead, instead of saying, Moses, we're thirsty, could you talk to God for us? Now they begin to blame Moses, begin to get upset. And they even said here, and this has really caught my attention. He said in verse seven, because it was so dry upon them, They said, is the Lord among us or not? Is he going to help us or not? And many times, this so many Christians, even myself, I must be honest, you just think, God, are you really there for me? Because where are you in my situation? Where are you? Why would you let this happen? Why would you let it get so dry? Why would you bring us to a season where there is no rain? Why would you bring us into a place and if I'm led by your spirit, then why is it so dry? If I'm where I'm supposed to be, then why is it so dry? If I'm doing, if I'm living the life I'm supposed to live, then why am I having so many battles with so many enemies? God, why is it so difficult? And, and Lord, if, if you're going to fight my battles for me, then why do I have to go pick out men and go and, and pray and st- keep my hands in the air? If you're, if you're my shepherd, you're going to do all my fighting for me. Well, the battle is the Lord's, but the victory is yours, but you have a part to play in it. We read it in Ephesians chapter 6. Again, it talks about taking unto yourself the whole armor of God, whereby you shall be able to quench, amen, every fiery dart or stand against every scheme of the devil. In other words, you have to dress yourself and go out to battle. Gideon had to go out to battle. Glory to God. Hallelujah. David had to go out to battle. They weren't laying in bed and God was fighting their battles for them. David fought and he hastened to the giant. Men, I feel God in this. Hallelujah. David hastened to the giant. The giant came at him, but David, he, he walked to him and came at him and he was talking to David. He goes, am I a dog that you've come out to fight me with st- sticks and stones? Am I a dog that you would try to chase me or off with a stick? Man, David, come to, David didn't uh, uh, back into that battle. The Bible says David hastened towards Goliath. He, glory to God, he picked up the pace. And he says, you come against me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you with what? The name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Moses held up that rod, God told him to take that rod and hold it up. That's the authority of the name of Jesus. The shepherd has the rod and the staff. What do the rod do? They comfort the sheep. The rod is not for the sheep. The rod is for the wolf. Amen. And so the rod is taken to the top. Glory to God. The rod is a type of authority. And the rod is a type of power. And when we stand before the Lord, praise God, and hold up the name of Jesus, as long as our hands are lifted up, you'll find it in in Hebrews chapter 12. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, lift up the hands which hang down. He's talking now, this is, this is New Testament. Lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, lest that which is lame shall be turned out of the way. Now, there's so many Christians out there, and I'm speaking this, for, and usually the hungry Christians are the ones that are watching this, and you're not the ones diffi- having the difficulties. Now, you're being attacked, but you're overcomers. And you're overcoming because you're hungry for God and you're seeking God. They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. But what happens when people begin to lose their hunger? I, I was praying this morning, and the Holy Spirit showed me, that uh, scriptures that, that I often preach and minister and share, that a smoking candle, a smoking flax, he will not snuff out. He will not quench it. He will not put the fire out. If there's just smoke coming off of you, he will not put the fire out. I heard the Holy Spirit in my spirit this morning while I was praying, saying, and, and from Romans chapter 1, said, and, and, and that scripture that says, and God gave them over to their vile affections, because, because why? Because they had vile affections, because they were watching pornography, because they were full of lust, because they were homosexuals? No. God gave them over to their vile affections 
because, not because they had sin in their life, not because they had failed God, not because they were struggling with immorality, because they did not want to to retain God in their conscience any longer. They got tired of fighting the battle. Man, I am hearing about people that I, even I've pastored who are growing weary and saying that I've, I've never lived worse for God than I'm living now. And boy, it makes me just, p- people that I've pastored in the past, and this breaks your heart knowing how strong they used to be in God, and now they're struggling, going back into the world, going back into the flesh, and, and, you, and you're not seeking God. They're not going to a church that's on fire for God and, and they're not they're not being challenged by leadership any longer and, and and you think oh I get so tired of my parents always getting on me I get so tired of always t- someone telling me what to do I can't wait till I get old enough to get out of the house and then you get old enough to get out of the house and you get out there and you find out that living with mom and dad wasn't nearly as tough as you thought it was then you can't wait to go back to your father's house because at least you got a, a roof over your head at least you got a, a warm bed at least you got a warm meal at night at least you have were with people that generally loved you, weren't perfect, but they loved you and they, and they sacrificed for you. And we begin to find out that following Jesus, oh, this is so hard. I'm so unfulfilled so, serving the Lord. So you begin to go out and you go back and you begin to do what? You get tired of getting up and praying. You get tired of going to church. And so the enemy speaks to your flesh and tells you, why don't you sleep in today? And you go, oh, well, I deserve a break. I have worked hard this week. God understands. God is love. And what you don't understand is this, or what you're allowing the devil to deceive you, is that if you begin to drop your hands, God cannot help you. You limit God. We limit the Holy One of Israel. Come on. We limit Him. When God told Moses, when God told him to go on that mountain and bring that rod, when Moses lifted his hand, there was victory. When Moses' hands dropped, Amalek began to prevail against all the the children of Israel. Not just Moses. He began to prevail against all the children of Israel. When the rod is up, you prevail. Did you notice that there's still a war? Moses' hands are in the air and he's prevailing. But the battle's not over. Just because you're winning, just because you have the advantage, you're the king of the hill, doesn't mean the battle's over. They were winning, but then you read that apparently as the battle wore on, the days, the weeks, the months wore on, all of a sudden Amalek began to prevail because Moses' hands got tired and they dropped to a side. How many times have you been on top? And you've seen yourself walking on sunshine, man. And you're feeling the victory. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. You feel the victory. You feel the joy of the Lord is your strength. And man, I say to you, be where you stand lest you fall. For that victory is not eternal. That victory is from daily bread from day to day. And the worst thing you can do is to think, uh, I've got it and I've got it forever. Because God, God has promised this and you'll see this in the scripture. That Amalek, even if you defeat him that day, he will come back to fight you another day. I'm going to prove this to you from the scriptures. That you never get, and, and please understand, you're not going to make the devil go to hell. Demons are not going to go into the abyss. They're not going until Jesus puts them there. Till Michael the archangel wraps it up, wraps a chain on him and puts him in, and puts him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. The devil is not in hell. Demon spirits are not in hell. They are in the earth. And they are, and the, and the devil goes to, and he accuses us before God. He's the accuser of the brethren. And so understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against, against uh, uh, evil spirits in heavenly places. Now, we, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we do have a fight. And we're told to fight the good fight of faith. What is the good fight of faith? You keeping your hands in the air. And I'm not speaking about physically putting your hands in the air. But it's you coming before the Lord. And it's you lifting up what? Lifting up holy hands, Paul writes to Timothy, without doubting, with, without doubting God and without anger towards God. Did you notice here that they were angry at God, but they took it out on Moses? So guess what? They wouldn't want to go to church when you're mad at the preacher. You're not going back to church. 
Well, guess what happens when you quit going to church? You quit having the anointing of God that's upon that pastor, that's upon that leadership, that's upon those elders, that's upon that congregation. When you quit going to church, the favor and the blessing, the corporate blessing, you come out from underneath that. That is exactly what Satan's plan is for you. When your hands get tired and they get to drop down and the very last thing you need to do is separate yourself from Aaron and her. Aaron and her, if Moses had been on that mountain by himself, if he'd have been isolated by himself, the entire nation of Israel would have been destroyed by the, by, by the Amalekites. By Amal- Amalek and Amalekites. Every Amalek and the Amalekites. I'll get it right. His people are the Amalekites. He's Amalek. And even though God is for the Jew and God's for the Israelites and God's for the Hebrew and God's for the body of Christ, you will be defeated if you put your hands down for a long period of time. And if you isolate yourself, if you isolate yourself from the body of Christ, Satan will isolate you and he will wear you down. He'll wear you down and it'll be fun for you to rebel for a season. It'll be fun for you to get out of church. You'll get to sleep in. It's like skipping school. It sounds like it's a ton of fun till the final exam's given and you weren't in the classroom to get the notes and now you fail the class. Satan promises you everything that he cannot deliver. He promises you nothing but a flesh fest. He promises you nothing but rest from your battles. But you understand this. When you put your hands down and you start losing your hunger, you start losing your victory. And though you are a born again, blood bought son and daughter of the living God, the devil will defeat you. You'll go to heaven when you die. You'll, you'll be a child of God and God loves you. He loves you here while you're being defeated. He loves you while you lose. But what good does it do you that God loves you and you be defeated? By, and what happens to you is you get mad at God. God's told you to lift up the hands which hang down. Lift up the hands which hang down. Lift them up. Hebrews 12, 12. Lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Feeble knees means you're tired of walking with God. You're tired of the battle. You're tired of standing. You're tired of trying. You're, try, you're tired of working on this marriage. You're, you're, you're tired of submitting to, to authority. You're tired of saying, of being on time. You're tired of tithing. You're seen, you've seen no return. Glory to God. You've seen little to nothing. And the enemy is reminding you day by day that it's not working. But I have news for you. If he wasn't working, then why is the enemy barking at you day and night? If it's not working, then if he's already got you, if the devil already has got you, what's the use of even trying to intimidate you or to discourage you? If you belong to him, then he already owns you. But no, my brothers and sisters, his job is to discourage you. His job is to disarm you. And and when we put our hands and, and, and when we lift our hands to heaven, trusting in the living God, then the living God sends the holy angels and the spirit of the living God begins to infuse the people of God, hallelujah, around you. And you begin to win the invisible war. You don't see the enemy, glory to God, hallelujah. You don't see the enemy. But let me tell you something, Elijah, Elijah didn't see the, 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 the army of God. He saw all the host that were coming against him and Elisha. And Elisha said, oh Lord, there's so many, even so many uh, that are against us. And Elijah prays, God open up Elisha's eyes and realize, let him see that there are more that are for us than are against us. There was a war going on. And here comes an army against Elijah and Elisha. And they were, and Elisha was freaked out of his mind. But Elijah who did not see, he saw the natural enemy, but he did not see the, uh, the army of God. But Elijah knew, glory to God, because he could feel the presence of God and the anointing of God. And he realized, if I have the presence of God, if I've got the anointing of God upon me, I don't care what I see with my eyes, there are more that are for me than are against me. And I will prevail. When the anointing of God comes upon you, you are prevailing. It's not you that, pre- it, actually it is you that prevails, but it's the Spirit of God and the Spirit of might upon you that's coming through you like it's coming through me right now and it pushes back the invisible enemy. Elijah said to God, Lord, open up Elisha's eyes and let him see there be more for us than against us. And God opened up Elisha's eyes and he saw flame, Elisha, and he saw flaming chariots of the Lord. 
that were more, and it was just like Elijah said. Elijah didn't see the flaming chariots. Elisha did. Yet Elisha had less faith than Elijah did. This sounds like what Jesus said. More blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Elijah knew that there was more, and even though the, the army of God was invisible, the battle was the Lord's. And he knew because the Spirit of God was on him. You see, as I'm preaching to you right now, the Spirit of God is upon me. And I know that we're winning the battle. Right now, the very fact that you're tuned in, the Spirit of God is moving to you. It's moving into you and it's strengthening you. And stay with it. And don't let the enemy say, turn that guy off. He's too loud. Oh, he preaches too fast. Turn out those things because the devil knows. While we have this treasure, this glory in an earthen vessel, I'm not perfect and my, my speech is not perfect and my life is not perfect, but the anointing upon me is perfect. And it's not me that's your healer, it's the anointing that's your healer. My father was a physician. My father said, son, it's not, it's not me that does the healing. It's the, and and he, he referred to it when I was a little boy, it's the man upstairs is what he used to say. I'm not the healer, the man upstairs is. And, and, and my father would know that he administered the right drug. He administered the right, the, the, right, uh, uh, the right prescription to them. And the drug made them well. He understood that he just understood how to apply the right thing to the right, to the right situation. And a right outcome would happen. And the, and the people love my dad. They didn't write the pharmaceutical company and say, thank you for sending that penicillin. They write my dad and say, thank you, Dr. Haynes, so much for what you've done to, to save my life. And my father understood it was God and the medicine that made them well, not him. Yes, he was a participant with that. Yes, he had his role to play in it, as, just as we do. But we understand, I understand just like my father, that when I have pr- glory to God, when I prevail, and when the brethren prevail, it's not because we are spectacular. It's because we uh, had enough, enough desire in our heart. There's at least enough smoke on us to continue to lift our hands and begin to call on the name of the Lord and not, redri- not drift back and not begin to constantly say and complain, is the Lord among us or not? You can start, when someone starts having that attitude, I've had that attitude in my past. And you think, oh, God, when God comes through, you feel so bad. And you should feel bad, not, not feel bad to learn not to do it again. Sometimes we do it over and over until we finally learn. And God is long-suffering and he's patient with us. He's not going to kick you out just because you, you get upset with him. <clears throat> the Bible's very clear that the, the children of Israel, they tempted him ten times in the wilderness. <clears throat> it goes, have you not, you lo, you tempted me, lo, these ten times? So it wasn't just one time that, that God got. God doesn't get on them the first time they did something wrong. They, they kept doing it over and over and over again. And that's why God brought a correction to them. Because they kept on the, doing the same thing over and over again. I want you to see here. Is this good or what? You see, if you want to quit, you can't. But God has put exhorters in the body of Christ. And exhorters, nobody wants to be around an exhorter when they want to quit. Because exhorters won't let you quit. Now, there are great pastors and teachers... But there's people with a gift of exhortation, and pastors have it. People in the congregation have it. Evangelists have it. People say, well, that guy's an exhorter. Exhorters, exhorters call you on to battle. They call you on to persistence. They call you on to, to uh, persevere. They call you on to reach down deeper. Glory to God. They call you on to lift up your hands. And they also not only do that, but they help hold up your hands by begin to speak to you till the life of God begins to flow in you. They're like a spiritual IV. They continue to speak to you until your fluids are restored, until your electrolytes are restored, until the the balances, the things that are missing in your spiritual chemistry, the Spirit of God continues to give you. Sometimes when when the anointing comes upon me, I weep. Sometimes I sing. Sometimes I pray fervently. Sometimes I pray in the Spirit. Sometimes I just be still and know that He's God. But whatever the doctor brings, I understand on the inside to let it flow or to speak still and to know that he's God sometimes just standing in the quiet with the anointing of God coming to me refuels me without me saying a word but sometimes when the spirit of God touches me like right now I speak like a machine gun I speak like a mighty flamethrower why we're we're filling you back up again because you're getting tired but all of a sudden an Aaron comes along a her comes along and they place a rock I'm placing a rock underneath you today and you can sit down. God didn't say, he had, didn't say he had to stand. He just has to stay with the battle. You know, on the day of Pentecost, you know, we like, people have got all these positions and posture to pray. Then you go, they got to get on their knees and pray. I, I seldom ever pray on my knees. I read a scripture 
that, that, that two scriptures in the Old Testament that just kind of got with me and stayed with me for 40 years. 1981 is really when I started really praying and got saved in 78. 81 is when I really started encompassing and, and, and embarking on this prayer walk. And I, I began to read that, at, that Adam, that the voice of the Lord came down and walked with Adam in the cool of the day. That God communed with Adam when they walked. I saw that the scripture says that Enoch walked with God and was not. He was taken for his testimony was pleasing to God. He walked with God. And, 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 I, and I saw that when God would come down and walk with him, he could go on walks. My wife and I would go on walks in Florida. We'd take a vacation every year and go down to Fort Lauderdale and walk that beach. And, and we'd take about a, a 45 minute to an hour walk. And we'd just have great communion and great conversations about our, about our life, our future, uh, uh, the good things in our life, the hopes that we have, the dreams. And we walk that, we rock and there's, we walk that beach and there's two big rocks. And they're 45 minutes apart. And so we go touch with, and touch it with our toes, the one rock. And as soon as we touch that boundary, we turn around and walk all the way down to the end of that beach and touch this big rock that's right at the harbor there where the big ships come in for the cruise liners come in in Fort Lauderdale. And we stay right there. Beautiful place. And so we would, we would touch, our, we would touch that, the, those two boundaries every time we take that walk, if we have the strength and the stamina to go that long. And we would, we would touch those and we would commune with each other. And those things stick out with me as some of the greatest times of my life were communing with my wife, walking and talking, listening to the roar of the beach and watching the seagulls, just, just communing with someone that I love and the giving and receiving. This is the same thing we experience with God. It's the giving and receiving in the presence of God. Hallelujah. And, it, and just being in His presence fortifies you to where you can fight another day. Hallelujah. Praise God. When you're tired of fighting, you run from exhorters. Because exhorters won't let you quit. Exhorters are the guys that are, the, it, they're the ones that tell you when you're on your uh, diet plan. They're, the, they're, they're, they're your guys, your life coaches. They're the ones that are saying, man, you're doing good. Keep going. You know, when you're doing good, we've got people in our church that are uh, on a weight loss program and, and they're doing so well, they're losing s s bad weight and, and gaining good health. And when you see them, I mean, you better, I mean, if you don't tell them how great they look, with all due respect, then either you're just blind, haven't been paying any attention. And really and truly, when you look at them, it's such an encouragement to see that it's all things are possible. And if they can do it, then you can do it. And men, you need to acknowledge the good things that you see in their life because I can guarantee you, because I've done some of it, it's not easy to do that. And they have to make a quality decision and say no to the things that satisfy them instantly to say, to say yes to the things that are going to satisfy them in the long term. Glory to God. So you begin to get around them and... and and they've got coaches and they call in. They've got, to stay, they've, you know, they've got these people. They've got to, they're accountable. And so they've got to do their body weight and their body index and, and, and weigh themselves. And, and they've got to give an account. And so people don't sign up to do those things unless they're serious about getting better. You don't go pay for a personal trainer and pay that kind of money unless you are serious about getting some rock hard abs. People that just go in there and stab or walk around the gym for two or three minutes and spend more time at the water fountain than they do on the treadmill, they're not, they're not going to stick with it. You, you can, you can look into the gym and you can basically tell 90% of the time who's going to stay with it and who's not. My son and I went and worked out over the Christmas holidays and, and the only, basically the only, mostly the most of the people who were in there were people that were hardcore people that are just dead serious because they understand that the routine that got them there is will keep them there. And even during the Christmas holidays, they were still there. The people that are not serious about it, they're the ones that show up after New Year's and they, after they gain that extra 15 pounds and they try to get that worked off. But there are some people that are in there before, during, and after the holidays. Those are your hardcore people. You know what most people say about those people? While they envy their bodies, I find that they criticize them. Oh, he's too muscular. Oh, she, a woman shouldn't have muscles like that. You know what? Your condemnation and shame and basically, for the most part, in many cases, it's just pure jealousy. It's not going to keep them from doing it. What it's going to cause them to do is even do more of it. 
Because they, that, because that, because they don't want to be unhealthy. They don't want to be obese. They, and even if they, if they're in a competition, they want to look good or feel good about themselves. We need to quit talking people out of it. Well, you're just too overzealous for the things of God. We, we, we believe in balance. Balance is not, is not faith and unbelief. Balance is not flesh and spirit. Balance is this. Balance is putting God first place in your life, but that doesn't mean He's the only person you spend time with. It means that you give Him the predominant, the preeminent, the priority in your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, glory to God and His righteousness. God's not calling you to evade and ignore your children. God is calling you to spend time with Him first so that He can give you the wisdom and the strength and the grace to nurture your children up in the fear and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You spend time with God, He can fill you with the goodness, glory to God of His Holy Spirit. Then you're able to go love your wife as Christ loved the church. Why? Freely you've received, now freely you can give. And as long as your hands are up, praising God and worshiping God and going to Him, He will meet you and He will put a rock underneath you and, if, if, and, and He will send people into your life that will hold up your arms when your arms begin to get tired. We all, He says, even the young lions will, uh, will, will run out of strength. But they that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. And you know, I say this, if you're not in a local church, a lot of people that watch this are... I don't know if you go to church or not. There's a lot of people in our church watch it, and this, but it's watched by hundreds of other people. If you're not, if, it, it, you can't do this alone. If you're not going to go to church, find other Christian believers that you know and at least stay in contact with them on the telephone and the Internet because you're going to get in a place where you can't do it alone. You're going to get into a battle where you just can't do it by yourself. That's why you've got to have people that are around you. I have people in my congregation that lift me up. When I go through difficult times, I can feel the prayers of my people in my congregation that lift me up. I can feel their prayers because I, I begin to get into the presence of God easier. And the battles, are, are, the battles become doable, become winnable. And when I get tired, I realize it's not me that's, that's garnering the strength that people are interceding for me. Moses' hands were held up. Now listen carefully. Moses started holding his hands up. I want you to listen. And I want you to get this. That God will send people into your life to hold your arms up when you have lifted them up as long as you can. What, we're, what, we, what, what, what a lot of people end up doing in the body of Christ is using the preacher and using the pastor, wearing him down, wearing his wife down, wearing down those real sweet people, and I've got a, a, a good load of them in my church, that people will take advantage of them, that they won't come to church, but they'll call my people for prayer. They'll call them for prayer, and they won't themselves submit to God, but they'll go to my people and, and to my church to get them to help them. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with helping people for a season. But let me tell you, there comes a time that you have to breathe on your own. The machine can't do it for you, and someone can't give you CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation for 24 hours a day. Jumper cables are put on a car to see if, they can if that battery will take a charge. But if people are not going to ignite, hallelujah, if they're not going to catch fire, praise God. You see, when they put those, the paddles on people's chest to try to revive them from a heart attack, they don't strap them to their chest all day. They try it a few times, and if they don't respond, then they, they call them dead on arrival. And they, and they list the time. They'll give it several times, but, but they don't do it, they don't do it continually. And they certainly don't do it all day. They don't do it for an hour. They don't even do it for 15 minutes. They may do it for five minutes because they're brain, become to be brain dead after that. Understand that, that God, that, that you don't, you don't see a car running down the street with battery cables, jumper cables attached to the car next to it and they're living off each other's juice. No, it should take a, the, the, the battery, if the battery has any charge left in it whatsoever, any smoke left on the candle. If there's any smoke, then the little bit of the anointing that comes from me should light your fire again. I should blow on the embers, blow on the embers, and a little red dot should appear on your candle wick. A little dot should begin to... And then the flame, if you just continue to sit and listen to this teaching for 45 minutes, 40 minutes, then the life of God should begin. We're breathing into you. By the time you get through watching this for the one hour, you'll come out of here and you should, you've received a spiritual mouth to mouth. You've received an exhortation where the life coach begins to say to you, you're doing a good job. Okay, you can do this. The very fact that you tuned in here today, the very fact that whenever you're watching this, that you tuned into this to watch it, shows me that there's at least still some smoke on you. And if there's smoke on you and you get around another fire, that fire, your fire will catch fire again. Your smoking wick, the flax, the candle, shall catch again and shall burn as bright as ever. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. When one of the trees in the forest catch fire, the other trees generally catch it next. So this is why it's imperative that you be around the Aaron and the hers. But when one fire begins to dwindle, the other fires begin to rekindle the fire that once burned brightly in you. Do not isolate yourself. Proverbs 18. Was it Proverbs 18.1? Says says, talks about how a man separates himself. He separates himself from everyone, isolates himself. When you're isolated, you are prey for the enemy. He has separated you from the pack like, like lions like to do to a water buffalo, to a gazelle. They like to separate the weakest and the youngest from the, from the herd, from the pack. And as they separate them, they become, they could, the enemy begins to work on them till they wear them down. Amen. One can put a thousand a flight, two can put ten thousand, but how many can three put? If two, if two can put ten thousand, you become ten times stronger with every person that you add. So Moses was asked to do a job by God that Moses could not do by himself. He had to have other supporters with him to help hold his arms up. It was Moses' arms that had to be in the air. Aaron could not lift his arms for him. Her could not lift his arms for him. For, neither for Moses, but they could lift up Moses' arms. I cannot live your Christian walk for you, but I can help hold up your hands, praise God, till I, glory to God, till I find, till I begin to feel the firmness. You know, when I lay my hands on people, I can feel the anointing, the life, the power of God flow out of me into them. And I can tell them before they feel it. Not only can I tell them before they feel it, I can tell them what they feel when they, when, when they feel it. I can tell, I can describe exactly what they feel because I can feel it first and I feel it coming out of me going into them. By the laying on my hands, there's a discharge. There's a, there's a release of a, of a supernatural charge of power and life and zoe, the life of God. The anointing of God, praise God, the dunamis of God, explosive power. And, and, but mostly what it is, it's, it's that strengthening them with all might within their inner man. It becomes a supercharge, like you charge your battery for your phone. The, the laying on of hands is that conductor that you lay hands on them, and it doesn't take two hours to do it. I mean, it can, it's almost, it can be an instant charge. Can you imagine if your phone was instantly charged like that? You know what you do with a car when you charge the battery? All right, when you put the battery cables on it, you start that car up, then you take the battery cables off, then the car just runs and the alternator charges the battery. In other words, once I put my hands upon you and pray for you, the charge is in you. Now you've got the charge. The more you praise God, the deeper the charge and the greater it will be. Hallelujah. Praise God. So God may use me to, to reignite a fire, but I can't just sit there and pour gasoline on you all day. I can, God will use me to exhort you to start a fire, to quicken a fire within you. And, as long, and all of a sudden you get the strength return, then you can lift your hands again. If your hands get tired again, then we'll pick it up and do it again. But we're not going to sit there and hold your hands up all day long. They didn't, you, they didn't hold his hands up all day long. They held his hands up till he could get, get his strength again. People don't have to sit there and pray for you all day long. They pray for you till you can regain your step, to regain your strength, to regain that, that stamina. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. You, you know, I had a teacher at Oral Roberts University, Dr. Hilcom, Alaska, she said to us in our class, she goes, you need to find someone to pray for you. If you do anything, find someone that will pray for you. I thought, man, I'd pray, do my own praying for myself. I'm not waiting. I'm not going to depend on someone else to pray for me. They don't even pray for themselves. I didn't say that aloud. I just thought it was kind of, you know, I just thought, I'm not putting my life in someone else's hands like that. But you see, she was exactly right. Of course, she's, <laughs> duh, just like a spiritual parent. Of course, she knew she forgot more about God than I'd learned at that time. And I found that to be one of the greatest things you can ever have is having an Aaron and a her in your life. That we, but I've, and when you've done all the stand, sometimes you still get tired. And God's ordained it that way. Because God's not ordained you to ever be alone. God's not, this is why the Bible says God sets the singles. God, sense, God sets the solitaire, the solitary in families. God wants no body being by themselves. Because when the hands get tired... No one is there to lift them. I am encouraging you. I am encouraging you. Now, so many of you watch this from all over the country, so I'm, obviously I'm not recruiting you to my church. But I'm encouraging you to go to a church, and if this, if this ministry touches you, then they'll find someone that's, that, that makes you feel the same way. 
that you feel that same recharge, that same encouragement, that same quickening. Get yourself back into a local church. Now, understand no pastor is perfect. No pastor's wife is perfect. Nobody's perfect. But go where there is a prevalent anointing, a presence that supernaturally helps you and charges you. Folks, God does things when pastors are good. God does things when pastors are bad. God does things. There are people, I've seen pastors that have gone off in sexual immorality, and God is still an evangelist, and God has used them mightily to heal the sick. It doesn't make the sick any less healed, and it doesn't make the people that got saved in their ministry any less saved. Yes, it's a shame that people make mistakes, but everybody behind the pulpit, no matter who you are, nobody's lived a perfect life. So it's the grace of God. Go where there's grace that is coming through that pulpit and go where there is a predominant spirit of godliness. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect all the time, but a godliness, a consistent godliness, all right? Everybody can blow up from time to time, but a consistent godliness. Nobody and nothing's perfect, but the anointing is. And if we'll just, if we'll just begin to pick our, lift our hands back up, we'll begin to prevail again. Does that make sense? Praise God. It's good stuff today. Amen. Ah, oh, let's go a, bit, a little bit deeper here. We've got about 10 more minutes. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. He sat there on, and Aaron and Hur stayed up, stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. That means the battle waged longer than they anticipated. And Joshua, verse 13, Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Dis- com- discomfited. That means that... that <laughs> I love the King James. I mean, I, I, I'm just kind of stuck with reading. I've been, turn, you know, cut my teeth on the King James 40 years ago, and I just can't get away from it. I use many other translations, but I always preach out of this. And then I put it in my own Texas translation so people can understand it. Discomfited means that... <laughs> I'll just tell you what it means. One day I was... Uh, God had used me, especially in my younger years... To uh, in a deliverance ministry, and and I, I noticed that there's a t- there's a season in my life where I, I, I encountered a lot of demonic activity and w- with people that have been sexually abused, drug abuse, um, all kinds of all kinds of th- stuff that opened the door and gateways to evil spirits. I began to lay my hands on people and begin to see evil spirits begin to manifest, begin to come out. They begin to talk. Eyes roll back in their head. Fingernails would grow out in front of me. Their bodies would get stiff as board. 60, 70 pound girls would take six deacons that weighed over 200 pounds apiece and take them right up the aisle. I, I've, I've ministered this stuff for years and I've seen it for years. And I'll tell you what, the, the, seeing a 60, 70 pound girl with demonic power carrying 1,200 pounds of man, <laughs> big strong men too, just carrying them right up an aisle, man, on her back like a snake. And those men just like going along for the ride. And just casting demons out of them. And, 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 I, and I thought, when you cast the devil out, sometimes they scream. And you read about Jesus where they, they screamed with a loud voice and they, before they came out. Uh, I, I saw, I asked the Lord one time, I said, why do, they, why, do, why do demons scream? Watch this now. The Spirit of God spoke to me something. Boy, it must have been 30 years ago, at least 25, 30 years ago. I was in a season with the anointing. I was in a season where the glory was upon me. And, the, and, the, and the, for about two years, three year period of time, the, about two years, the presence of God was just, I couldn't already say Jesus' name without the glory of God just coming. And it just, and it was just, just like, it would just invade the room and it would just fill the room. And I feel it coming up out of me now. And it's always a, a remnant of that in me. But I mean, there was a season where it was upon me that I couldn't, I mean, I, it's, you could preach on whatever you wanted to preach on, the anointing of God would show up. And it was so easy. And I, thought, and I saw a lot of demonic activity during that time. And I asked the Lord, I said, why is it? He says, the same fire. I goes, I've anointed you with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God and fire. He goes, well, to the believer, the fire of God is something they receive and it infuses them. To the evil spirits, he goes, the snakes always fear the grass when it's set on fire. It begins to run out of the grass because there's nowhere to hide. He goes, you're setting something on fire on them. And he goes, they, watch this. Here's what he spoke to me. I'll never forget, never forgot it. He says that the evil spirits begin to cry out, Jesus, Jesus, have you come to torment us before our time? 
Why would they say to torment us before our time? Because when the presence of God came, evil spirits began to cry out of people right in the middle of the synagogue, right in the temple. When Jesus was preaching, evil spirits began to talk out of the mouth. Now, they've been in church for years and they never spoke up. But when the fire of God showed up and the anointing of God showed up, evil spirits began to speak out of the mouth of people that were sitting in the pews. Jesus, have you come to torment us? He wasn't talking. Those weren't people talking. It was evil spirits talking to the people. In other words, they were beginning to experience torment. When, the, uh, when, when, when Joshua discomfited, discomfited the Am- Amalek, Amalek is a type of Satan. is a type of evil spirit, a principality of power, a, a ruling spirit. And, and when you begin to have the anointing of God upon you and that your hands are lifted up and your eyes are on Jesus and the presence of God is coming on you and to you and through you, then understand that while you're feeling the victory, the enemy is feeling the fire. When you're being transformed and, re- and infused, he's being refused and he's being, sh- he's being shunned and he's being driven out of the dark place. The light is beginning to come on. He's beginning to be exposed that he's not nearly as strong. And if he may be strong, but greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And I'm not saying the devil's weak. I'm just saying the greater one lives on the inside of you. And that's why the Bible says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. The enemy will never be scattered until God is allowed to arise. But when God arises through the exhorter, when God arises through the prayer warrior, when God arises through the preacher, when God arises through your mouth through praise and worship and the candle of God has been lit, then the light of God comes. And when the light of God comes, there's no more shadows. When the light of God comes, the vermin begin to run out from the shadows and they begin to try to seek rest and find none. The power, when the light of God comes, the darkness flees. When the power of God comes, the enemy gets defeated and his hands begin to hang down. You see it in the wilderness when Jesus defeated, when he continued to refuse Satan's advances. The Bible says the devil left him for a more opportune time. I say that to you because I'm going to close this up by saying this. Verse 14, Joshua discomfited Amalek. You don't destroy the devil, you make him leave for that day. You make him even leave for a season. He's not done with you, he's done with you right now because you're full of the Holy Ghost. You're full of commitment. Your hands are in the air and you've been recharged and refired and refueled and Satan's going to say, I can't do anything with this one until he begins to get lax again and his hands begin to wear down through time. Verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Now what did he say? I will put out Amalek. I'll put his name out from under heaven. I'll, I'll wipe his name out forever. But then, isn't that interesting? Look at verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Do you know what Jehovah Nisi means? Now, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Je- Je- Amen. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. There's all these Jehovahs. Jehovah Desid Canoe, the Lord my righteousness. Jehovah Nisi is the Lord is my banner. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I tell you, I understand this one. This is, this is one of the, the sides, the, the banners. You see, God comes by many names, but Jehovah, then there's an adjective behind it. There's a Jehovah the God, that he is God. But Jehovah Rapha, he's a healing God. Jehovah the Sidkenu, he's a God that gives righteousness. Amen. Jehovah Shalom, a God that brings peace and, and brings you to be at one, spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Amen. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. You know what that means? When you go to war, you've watched any war movie, you see, you see that the American flag, the Star Spangled Banner we sing in the National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, that, 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 that flag still waves through the bombs bursting in air, gave proof of the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, can you see, right? And, 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 and that, that, that banner was still waving. That's what the banner, God is our banner. God is our flag. It is a, it is a standard with a flag, a sail. 
a banner, a flag, and he raises up going, the Lord, the Lord is with me. The Lord is my banner. I fight underneath the banner of po the power of God. I have the rod of God in my hand. As Moses had the rod of God in his hand and his hand had to be lifted up, you have the rod of God in your hand. Now lift it up and begin to call on the name of the Lord and you will find that the Amalek and his enemies will become discomfited and he'll begin to, de and he'll begin to, de to, to decrease and the victory shall begin to increase. But you notice the battle wears on and wages on through the, out through the whole day. Though you're gaining ascendancy doesn't mean you've won the battle. Notice this, that the battle was waged until the sun set. It took approximately 12 hours, give or take an hour, for you to win the battle, though your hands were in the air the entire time. The enemy doesn't leave just because you're putting up a fight. But having done all to stand, stand. And the enemy will run out of strength because there's no resupply, no refueling station for him as long as your hands are in the air. If you need assistance, this is what friends and pastors and church groups are for. Prayer meetings are for. That when you can't do it alone, no one can do it alone forever. You can do it a little while, but not forever. Find someone that will intercede for you. Some, find someone that will pray. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Three minutes to go. Hallelujah. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is more than just my shepherd. I fight underneath his name. I hold the rod up, praise God. And when, I, when my arms are up and I, and I still call on the name of the Lord, I will prevail. When my arms begin to come down, my will be, I will be prevailed against. And this is what's so sad. We're not defeated because God is weak. We're not defeated because God has left us. Is God among us or not? God will never leave us, never forsake us. But this is why Paul write, writes to Timothy, stir up the gift of God that's within you. Sometimes it takes a friend Sometimes it takes a counselor to, to find the God inside of you, to speak to that inner man, to get him so full of faith and encourage that he wants to get up again and stand in for another day. And this is what we're to do, to encourage one another, to help bear one another's burdens. If you know someone's in trouble, intercede for them, particularly when you know they're doing all that they can do to, to take care of it. Those are the ones you want to invest your life in the most because those are the ones that are giving their all. As soon as they get well, and they come out of their situation. They're the very ones that will remember you when you're in your time of trouble. Verse 16 and finally. And he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Did you see that? He says, I'm going to bring an end to him. Tell Joshua, I'm going to bring an end to Amalek and wipe out his name for, forever. But watch this. But then he comes back in the next verses. For he said, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Friends, let me tell you something. The enemy is not going to be around forever, but you will be. When all the smoke settles and the dust clears, you and I will be with Jesus both now and forever. Start exercising, continue to exercise your authority that you have in his name. The enemy will flee from you. What do I got? One minute. Hallelujah. One minute. Isn't that good? Watch this. Galatians 6, 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You see the power of persistence and sticking with it? In Jeremiah 45, 3, You said, Ah, woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning and have found no rest. This is what happens to our, our flesh. Our flesh does not get resupplied with, with sleep. Our bodies get resupplied with energy, but our spirit does not get resupplied with sleep. Our spirit gets resupplied with the touch of God. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and immovable. Always excel in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore, since we have this ministry, through the mercy of God, we faint not. Often, it shows you there's, there's wars to be fought and persistence to be endured. Hebrews 12.3 For consider him that endured such contradiction, resentment, and hatefulness of sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
We lose heart sometimes because we think, I'm the only one doing this. No one's helping me. They said here, consider Jesus that endured such contradiction and resentment and hatefulness. Sometimes when you try to reach out to people, they're not good to you. They'll abandon you. They'll betray you. They'll say all manner of evil against you. And you know what? You, and you can get so discouraged. You think, why am I even doing this? For consider him. He went through it. You continue to do it because it's the right thing to do. It pleases God and it protects you and it causes you to prosper. They'll come around, and if they don't come around, it won't matter in the first place. But if your ways please the Lord, He'll make your enemies at peace with Him. Romans 2, 7, To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. What? To them who by patient continuance sticking with it, staying with it, staying filled with the Spirit, finding people that will stand with you, and having done all to stand to stand. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing, they seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. I tell you, this is, there's only one life worth living. It's a life that's with Jesus, and it's a life filled with the Spirit. I bless you today in the name of Jesus. I hope this has rekindled a fire in you and strengthened you and poured some more oil in your lamp and brought a greater uh, touch of God and blessing and encouragement to your soul and your spirit. I love you today. Jesus loves you. We'll see you next time, God willing. Amen. 